during the panel you talked about reciprocal causality and how this helps us uh, get off the ground. Uh, these uh, like the pollinator and flowers. And now I would, you know, is it possible for you to to uh, think out loud about the possibilities of these contemplative and scientific perspectives? You know, helping us lift a, li a little bit above where we are right now. All right. Well, so I mean, the example of of uh, things interacting, of course, use things like a predator prey or more interesting pollinators and flowers. They evolve with each other. So I suppose you're imagining that the religious perspective and and the scientific perspective can mutually inform each other. I mean, that you can perhaps learn something about. Uh, uh, religious experience or the nature of religious truth even for that matter from a scientific perspective mm -hmm. and vice versa I suppose you think you might learn something about uh, uh, the true nature of what science is investigating from a religious perspective and certainly that's that's possible I mean uh, I'm less clear about exactly how that would go because it's not the kind of uh, perspective that I'm working inside of. I mean, it's easier for me to understand how, say, as Evan Thompson talks about, that you have a phenomenological perspective and a neuroscience perspective, and they together mutually inform each other. So you come to better understand your experience by learning something about the neural substrates of it in certain ways. You may even gain some ability to control some of your experiences in certain ways. Conversely, you go what you're looking for in the brain mm -hmm. by uh, having some idea of some important distinctions that you discover from the first person perspective mm -hmm. from the inside and then you go looking for those and maybe even you do them simultaneously maybe you have certain kinds of mm -hmm. meditative experiences as mm -hmm. they've been doing and, and we hear people who put people who have long-term contemplative techniques in an fMRI tube and they look to see what kind of changes occur in their brain during that time mm -hmm. and maybe you learn something then about uh, of the nature of awareness, and maybe we even learn something about how um, our fundamental sense of what it is for something to be real. I mean, there was talk about time. I mean, so I suppose time is one of those topics that is deeply philosophical puzzling. I mean, there's the experience of time, and then there's also the reality of time, and whether time is real or an illusion. It's hard for us to imagine that time isn't real, but there's lots of people, not just philosophers, but even physicists, who will say, well, you know, it's really just all space-time. The movement of time, the notion that time, that there's a passing away and coming to be, uh, is illusory. Uh, so, well, okay, so then there's the experience of time, there's the scientific objective study of time. How do they play out against one another? That would be an example where I think there could be some kind of mutually uh, reinforcing kind of process of discovery. Uh, this morning I had an interview uh, with uh, Nat and he told me when after the panel on Dharmakirti and epistemology knowledge uh, he was surprised to learn how familiar some of Dharmakirti's arguments uh, and some of the discussions uh, Dharmakirti had sounded to him. From his yeah, well that's not surprising. I mean again I know very little about the Eastern tradition but I had a similar experience some years ago because mainline analytic philosophy in the United States is really done within a fairly narrow confine of people working in certain traditions. Uh, and I spent a summer basically studying the phenomenological tradition, reading Husserl and Heidegger and um, Merleau-Ponty, and realizing that many of the arguments, many of the disputes, uh, were actually mirrored on the two sides of, the, uh, of these. These are literatures that in general aren't read by the same people. The same people don't work on them. There's some increasing tendency in that regard, Evan Thompson being a good example of somebody who tries to embrace both literatures, but in general they're done by separate people, sometimes even in separate departments and different universities. And yet when you look at the history of these, you find that in many cases the very same debates, for example, the primacy of individual versus the social, uh, the contextual versus the non-contextual, um, these kind of debates have exact parallels right. in the two cases. So it's not that the the continental so-called tradition and the analytic tradition are opposed. In fact, they're, people within the two camps are much more like each other mm -hmm. than they are like uh, the other. So I suppose that when you go to the Eastern tradition, it's not surprising that questions about knowledge and experience and perception and cognition mm -hmm. followed some of the traditional trajectories through the space of possibilities and that people working on it. And it's, it's unfortunate that most philosophy departments in the United States wouldn't have anyone who knows it. I mean, we have no one who knows it. We have people, but they're in religion departments. I mean, uh, most philosophy departments 
while they might feel the need to have somebody who does, you know, this philosophy of language versus this philosophy of mind versus this fairly decision theory, fairly narrow specialties. And if they didn't have somebody like that, they would feel the need to get it. And they don't feel the need to have anybody who knows the Buddhist tradition, the Indian tradition, the Chinese tradition. These are just sort of, well, those are something different and they don't. Um, you had this little explora exploration going on with Tutan Jimpa on emergence. And, yes. You know, uh, did you get a real sense of what he was after? Well, I, I think, as far as I understood, I mean, there, there's a lot of people who find the notion of um, physicalism somewhat hostile to the notion of taking consciousness seriously. I mean, and I suppose this is, would be an analogy of what you asked me about earlier. I mean, some people would think, well, if you're if you're really a hard-nosed scientist, then you shouldn't take, you know, theism seriously or something, or religious, religion as a source of knowledge seriously. And here is the same kind of uh, opposition. Namely, a lot of people think, well, if you're really serious that, that consciousness is real and consciousness is causal and consciousness has effects in the world, then you're not just a physicalist. You can't say everything is physical. And yet there are people, and I take out myself among them as well as lots of others, who want to say, no, consciousness is real. Consciousness is just as real as life. And it's and it's very important and, and systems that are conscious are very different than those that aren't just the systems that are alive are very different than those aren't but in the end to be conscious hopefully can be understood or we think can be understood as a very complex kind of physically realized process in brains but I also don't think there's going to be any simple aha moment there's not going to be any simple aha see if you just saw that one little link you'd see how it fits together and the complex consciousness is much too complex many-headed a thing there's not going to be any one explanation. What you're going to get, hopefully, over time, and maybe not, is a lot of bridges built by people working in different paradigms trying to make connections. Uh, and so the more connections there are, the more confident we'll say, okay, yes, we don't fully understand it as part of the physical world, but we have reason to believe that it is a part of the physical world. Again, same thing with life. I mean, with life, we did have DNA. We had Watson and Crick, but even then, no one thinks that we understand how a complete human being arises from a fertilized zygote. I mean, all the processes of epigenesis that leads from it, we're, we're confident it does, but how it does, I mean, nobody would remotely suggest that molecular biologists have a complete story to tell yet. I mean, they, they, they'd say, well, we think we're on the right track, but there's an awful lot. And there's going to be not just a lot of little details, there's probably going to have to be some fairly large scale rethinking of the process that's going to be required in the course of the development of biological theory. And I think the same thing is going to happen with consciousness. Well, I think it's very it's it's very lively. I mean, and it's it's nice to see these different uh, perspectives coming together here. And I think, uh, as I say, there's far too little contact in general. There are people. I mean, Evan Thompson, excellent example because he's he's interested in phenomenology. He's a meditator, and he's also very interested in neurophenomenology. So he's a paradigm case of somebody who's trying to, and he's you know the new generation coming along. I mean, in a certain sense, he's he's um, probably in his 40s. I'm not really sure, but he's. And I think there's going to be more people like that who are going to try to be synthetic, bringing together uh, different traditions and trying to get them to play off one another, just as people in my generation uh, embraced cognitive science and a certain kind of neuroscience approach and said, oh, okay, that wasn't part of philosophy. When I first entered philosophy, the notion that you would incorporate work from empirical cognition into your work on philosophy didn't exist. Now it's a commonplace. I mean, you wouldn't, if you had a graduate student in the United States who wanted to do in philosophy of mind, Part of what you do is say, make sure you take several courses in, in cognition and in cognitive neuroscience. I mean, otherwise, you're not going to have any future in this field. Well, 10 years ago, it would, it would have been hard to imagine that like 15,000 neuroscientists would turn up at the lecture of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Uh, <laughs> did you hear that? Was this um, at the, the, the neuroscience Society meeting? Society for Neuroscience. There yeah. were 15,000 people there, who, uh, uh, members. Right. So, uh, who could, uh, right, it's hard to believe that there are 15,000 neuroscientists anywhere that could gather in one place. That in itself is frightening. <laughs>